um, once more, let's uh, pray and uh, ask the Lord to speak to us this morning with today's service. Um, Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you brought us here this morning, that you brought us here safe, um, Lord, and you have a reason and purpose for everyone being here. We believe that, we trust in that, and so um, we now ask you that you open the hearts and minds of those that are here. Also, open up the hearts and minds of those watching this live or hearing, watching this recording later on or hearing it as well uh, at some other date, Lord. And I pray you will bless them and you will speak to them powerfully through your word and through this message. You help me to prepare. So uh, bless us now, Lord. Um, and may we just hear from you now. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as many of you know, you, maybe you don't know, last week we finished pretty much a 10-month verse-by-verse study of Second Samuel, or First and Second Samuel, the books of Samuel. And so what I've decided to do these next couple months is we're going to um, go into, we're going to do some topical teachings. Um, this is going to be a little different than what we normally do here at Calvary Chapel. We usually do book-by-book book and verse-by-verse. But um, I don't want to get starting. In, I don't want to get started into a book, and then have to, you know, cut it down or have to pause it because the ho- there's going to be some special holiday messages we're going to be delivering. So I think we're going to be starting with a brand new book, um, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, in the uh, starting in January. So I'm still praying about that. But in the meantime, these next few weeks, we're going to have some some topical teachings, which I think you will enjoy, you will be blessed by, and you, like, I, like I prayed about, like we've been saying, we, we definitely think you'll be growing as believers in Christ. And so this morning, I've titled today's message, The Best Spiritual Supplements, and we're going to be in Second Peter chapter 1. And uh, while you turn there, I want to share a quote from John Newton, and he said this, I am not what I might be. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I wish to be. I am not what I hope to be. But I thank God I am not what I once was. And I can say with, with the great apostle, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Now, if you're a believer... That's absolutely true. But as Newton alluded to, Christians ought to aspire to be greater than who they are now. They ought to aspire to be more Christ-like. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. Now, there are times in this Christian walk when it will seem as though progress is stagnant, slow, or even monotonous. Now, in those seasons, whenever you feel this way, I want you to keep in mind these words from Amy Carmichael. Sometimes when we read the words of those who have been more than conquerors, we feel almost despondent. I feel that I shall never be like that. But they won through step by step, by little bits of wills, little denials of self, little inward victories by, faithful, uh, by faithfulness in very little things. They became what they are. No one sees these little hidden steps. They only see the accomplishments. But even so, those small steps were taken. There is no sudden triumph, no spirit, there is no sudden triumph, no spiritual maturity. That is the work of the moment. But regardless of whether there's huge or minimal progress, there must be growth nonetheless. Because 
anything that has life has to grow. And just like physical life, spiritual growth isn't automatic. It requires cooperation with God and the application of spiritual diligence and discipline. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13 says, Work out your own salvation, for it is God who is working in you. When it comes to growth and maturity, here are two things that I've discovered. First, the quality of a product being produced or developed lies upon the time and effort put into it. And second, if instructions aren't followed carefully, you will, in most cases, have an unsatisfactory result. J.C. Ryle put it like this. Whose fault is it, I should like to know, if a believer does not grow in grace, the fault, I'm sure, cannot be laid on God. He delights to give more, he, he delights to give more grace. The fault, no, do, no doubt, is our own. We ourselves are to blame, and no one else, if we do not grow. And so you see, as, as if, if a Christian isn't growing, they either aren't making an effort or aren't following the instructions God has laid out in his word to spiritually grow. And so in our passage today, the Apostle Peter will tell us how Christian believers can produce fruitful growth by building on our faith in Christ. Now, although today's message is, will mostly apply to believers, to born-again Christians, there's also lessons here that even non-believers can learn and understand. So let's turn to our Bibles and go to Second Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 5. The Word of God says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with goodness, goodness with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, Self-control with endurance, endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The person who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted and has forgotten the cleansing from his past sins. Therefore, brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election, because if you do these things, you will never stumble. Now, uh, before getting into the meat and potatoes um, of our passage, I want to carefully examine what, what verse 5 says first. But... In order to do that, really, we have to go back and read chapter, I mean, verse 3, which says this. His divine power has given us everything required for life and good godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. This verse, verse 3, should be of immense uh, interest to every Christian because it tells us how we can keep from falling, it fail, falling in this life and how we can be assured of a triumphal entry into the next. First, we're assured that God has made full provision for us to have a life of holiness. This provision is said to be the evidence and evidence of his power. Now, the gospel is the power of God to save from the penalty of sin and from its power, from damnation and from defilement. And so just as his power saves us 
that same power also gives us what we need to live holy lives once we're saved. This power includes the high priestly work of Christ, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the activity of angelic agencies on our behalf. It also includes the new life we receive at conversion and the instruction of the Word of God. Furthermore, the power to live a holy life comes through the knowledge of Him who called us. Just as His divine power is the source of holiness, so the knowledge of Him is the channel. Thus, to know Him is eternal life, and progress in knowing Him is progress in holiness. So you see, the better you get to know Him, the more you will become like Him. Now, in both of his letters, our calling is uh, one of Peter's favorite themes. For example, for example, he reminds us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that we have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light. In 1 Peter chapter uh, 2, verse 21, we've been called to follow Christ in a pathway of suffering. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, we've been called to return blessing for reviling. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, we've been called to his eternal glory. And so now here in verse 3, he tells us that we've been called by his own glory and goodness. This means that he called us by revealing to us the wonders of his person. It doesn't come through intellectual understanding or intuition. It comes by way of revelation, that, that, uh, by way of a revelation that comes through experience. An experience God's people have of God himself. For Saul of Tarsus, this happened on the road to Damascus. There he was called when he saw the glory of God. A later, later disciple testified, I looked into his face and was forever spoiled for anything that was, uh, I was, for, uh, I was, and was forever spoiled for anything that was unlike him. See, he too was called by God's glory and goodness. Now, an important factor in all this is that a, is a person's willingness to trust in him who has called them. And this, ladies and gentlemen, takes faith. Hebrews 11.6 says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. Since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists. So you see, verse 3 is only possible through faith in Christ. This is the foundation that everything else is built upon. God lays that foundation when a person confesses Jesus as their Lord and Savior uh, and believes in their heart that God raised him from the dead. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God. And it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. So if God gives his children all they need to live godly lives, then his children must apply themselves in order to have fruitful progress in their Christian walk. Well, uh, verses 5 through 7, Peter tells us seven attributes to supplement our faith. So, again, in essence, Peter gives us the secret formula to a more productive and fruitful walk with Christ. The more you begin applying these qualities into your faith, the more you'll begin seeing significant progress in your spiritual growth. And as you exercise one, it's also important to develop another. All these are interwoven with one another. And if you try to skip 
or neglect one, you'll find it difficult to move on or grow. Like the fruit of the Spirit that Paul mentioned in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, these qualities grow out of a life, grow out of life and out of a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. See, it's not enough for the Christian to let go and let God as if spiritual growth were God's work alone. The father and the child must work together. Now let's examine each one of these carefully. And as we do, I want you to ask yourself, what areas are you uh, the most weakest in? The first one he mentions is to add to faith, uh, to add to faith is goodness. Goodness, or in some, some of your translation may say virtue, is conformity to one's life and conduct to moral and ethical principles. It's similar to having integrity or honorable conduct. Paul told the Philippian church that they ought to dwell on this. They have to dwell on virtue, on goodness. The idea is that the more you dwell on it, the more it will become part of your life. The more you think about it, the more it will become part of you and the more you'll start acting it out. In his book, Influence, Dr. Robert Cialdini of Arizona State University relates the story of a jewelry store owner who was preparing to go on vacation and left tasks for her staff to perform. She had a line of jewelry that hadn't been selling well, and she wanted the price cut in half. In her haste, however, she left a note that was unclear. When she returned, she was delighted to find that every piece of the jewelry was gone. She was, however, shocked to find that her staff had doubled the price of the jewelry. The pieces that hadn't been selling went out the door immediately once the price was raised because it changed the way people thought about them. Our thoughts determine our actions. What seems to us to be shocking and out of character behavior would be explained if we could see through the processes that have been going on internally. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 45, a good person produces good out of the good stored in, their, in his heart. An evil person produces evil out of the evil stored up in his heart, for his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. It's impossible to do rightly while thinking wrongly for an extended period of time. What's inside will come out. If you want your life marked by righteous actions, you must think righteous thoughts. This is why Peter wrote in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and, any, and there's anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Next. He mentions knowledge. This is having the general intelligence and understanding of what you exactly believe in. Specifically, in this case, moral wisdom, such as the kind seen in right living. The Bible gives us a plethora of practical wisdom by which we ought to live and conduct ourselves in our daily walk. A challenge Christians face every day is knowing God's word and obeying it. That's why James chapter 1 verse 22 warns us, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. And I like how William Cowper put it. Knowledge is proud that she knows so much. Wisdom 
is humble, that she knows no more. Third on the list is self-control. This is the type of self-control you practice when you put away those desires and passions that make you lose yourself. Now, this will vary from person to person. For some, it may be sexual, drugs, or alcohol, or even food, or even the internet and certain TV shows, but, you know, it makes you lose who you really are. In Acts chapter 24, Paul was sent before Felix, the governor, to answer for some accusations against him. Being somewhat familiar with the way, he adjourned the meeting in order to wait for Lysias, the commander. When Felix's wife, Drusilla, came to town, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in, the faith in Christ. Verse 25 uh, says, now as, she reasoned about, now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, go away now. When I, have, when I have a convenient time, I will call you. Felix heard and was convicted because he knew the life he was living wasn't right. In order to, spiritual grow, to spiritually grow, therefore, you must develop this self-control. Fourth, the fourth quality is endurance. One of the best definitions I read put it this way. The characteristics of a man who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. When teaching about the parable of the sower, Jesus said in Luke chapter 8, verse 15, the seed in the good ground. These are the ones who, having heard the word with an honest and good, good heart, hold on to it by enduring, producing fruit. Enduring this type of perseverance or patience when going through difficult times will help us regardless of the situation we're in. The Greeks had a race in their Olympic Games that was unique. The winner was not the runner who finished first. It was the runner who finished with his torch still lit. And so my hope is that all of you will run all the way with your flame, with the flame of your torch lit for the Lord. The fifth one Peter mentions is godliness. This type of godliness refers to a reverence and respect towards God. Spurgeon wrote, nearness to God brings likeness to God. The more you see God, the more, the more of God will be seen in you. So basically, the attitude you have towards God reflects the respect you have towards him. Rebelliousness and ungratefulness towards the creator of the universe grieves the spirit. And in the end, it won't go unpunished. By putting on godliness, we're told, our attitudes towards others will show in return and in return bear much fruit. First Timothy chapter four, verses seven and eight says, have nothing to do with pointless and silly myths. Rather train yourself in godliness for the training of the body has limited benefit, but godliness is beneficial in every way since, it's hold, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The sixth quality to add to faith is brotherly affection. This 
is the type, this is the love in which Christians cherish for each other as brethren. At the end of 1 Peter chapter 1, it says this in verse 22 and 23, since, you've been pure, since you have purified yourselves by your obedience to the truth, so that, you, so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other. From a pure heart, love one another constantly. Because you have been born again. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. Through the living and enduring word of God. So let me ask you. How are you showing brotherly or sisterly kindness to the brother or sister sitting next to you? Are you comforting one another in times of hardship? Are you rejoicing with them when they've been blessed? Love involves serving, sharing, and praying for one another. The Bible says in Romans 12, 10, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in honoring one another. In other words, don't wait for that person to, to, to love you. Take the lead. Honor that person. Love that person first. And finally, there's more to Christian growth than brotherly love. We must also have the sacrificial love that our Lord displayed when he went to the cross. This brothers and sisters, is the highest form of love that we can display to others. The kind of love spoken of in 2 Peter verse one, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, is agape love. The kind of love that God shows towards lost sinners. This is the form of love that Jesus gave to us. John 15, 9. As a father has loved me, I have also loved you. Remain in my love as well as the love that God has shown us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 tells us that God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Are you loving like Christ loved you. When you were a lost sinner, what kind of heart do you have towards those who mock you and ridicule you because of your faith? We must have this kind of love that Christ, that Christ has, that he gave to us when we were in the depths of our sin, when we were at our worst, he loved us. He loved you even when you were doing that one thing that grieved him tremendously. He still loved you. We should have that heart. According to 1 John 4, 7, we must examine ourselves in this light. Dear friends, John writes there, let us love one another because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Understand this, my friends. It's truly impossible for, fall, for falling human nature to manufacture, manufacture these seven qualities of Christian character. Why? The Spirit of God must produce them. Yes, of course, there are unsaved people who possess amazing self-control and endurance. But these virtues point to them and not to the Lord. They get the glory. When God produces the beautiful nature of his son in a Christian, it's God who receives the praise and glory. Because we have the divine nature. We can grow spiritually and develop this kind of Christian character. It's through the power of God and the precious promises of God that this growth takes place. A divine genetic structure is already there. 
God wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. The life within will reproduce that image if we diligently cooperate with God and use the means he has lavishly given us. And the amazing thing is this. As the image of Christ is reproduced in us, the process doesn't destroy our our own personalities. You still remain uniquely yourself. Now, one of the dangers in the church today is imitation. People have a tendency to become like their pastor or like a church leader, perhaps even like some celebrity Christian. As they do this, they destroy their own uniqueness while failing to become like Jesus Christ. And so they lose both ways. Just as each child in a family resembles his parent and yet is different, so each child in God's family comes more and more to resemble Jesus Christ and yet is different. Parents don't duplicate themselves. They reproduce themselves. And wise parents permit their children to be themselves. So how can the believer be certain that he is growing spiritually? Well, in verses 8 to 10, Peter gives, uh, gave three evidences of true spiritual growth. In verse 8, the evidence there is fruitfulness. Christian character isn't an end in itself, but it's also a means to an end. The more we become like Jesus Christ, the more the Spirit can use us in witness and service. The believer who isn't uh, growing is a useless, idle, barren, and unfruitful, his knowledge of Jesus Christ is producing nothing practical in his life. The people who fail to grow usually fail in everything else. Some of the most effective Christians I have known are people without dramatic talents or special abilities or even exciting personalities Yet God has used them in in a marvelous way. Why? Because they are becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. They have the kind of character and conduct that God can trust with blessing. They are fruitful because they are faithful. They are effective because they are growing in their Christian experience. These beautiful qualities of character do exist within us because we possess a divine nature. We have the Holy Spirit. If you are born again, you have the Holy Spirit. We must cultivate uh, the fruit, these characteristics, these things, so that they increase and produce fruit in and through our lives. In verse 9, Peter says vision is another evidence of spiritual growth. Nutritionists tell us that diet can certainly affect vision. And this is especially true in the spiritual realm. Paul said in 2 Corinthians verse Uh, Chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, that the unsaved person is in the dark because Satan has blinded his mind. Jesus, though, he tells us in John chapter 3, verse 3, that a person has to be born again before his eyes are opened and he can see the kingdom of God. But after our eyes are open, it's important we increase our vision and see all that God wants us to see. We can't 
be short-sighted Christians. There are some Christians who only see their own church or their own denomination, but who fail to see the greatness of God's family around the world. Some believers see the needs at home, but have no vision for a lost world. In John chapter 4, verse 36, Jesus admonished his disciples and is admonishing us as well. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. Some congregations today are like the church at Laodicea that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 3. They are proud that they are rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing and do not realize that they are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. It's a tragedy to be spiritually short-sighted, but it's even a greater tra tragedy to be blind if we forget what God has done for us, we will not be excited to share Christ with others. Through the blood of, of Jesus Christ, we have been purged and forgiven, ladies and gentlemen. Let me repeat that. Through the blood of Jesus Christ, we have been purged and forgiven. Are you? Does that excite you? Does that give you goosebumps? Does that make you want to tell the entire world? The gospel should excite you. God has opened our eyes. Let's not forget what he's done. Rather, let's cultivate gratitude in our hearts and sharpen our spiritual vision. Life is too brief, too short, and the needs of the world too great for God's people to be walking around with their eyes closed. In verse 10, the third evidence of Christian growth is stated. Security. If you walk around with your eyes closed, you will stumble. But the growing Christian walks with confidence because he knows and she knows that they are secure in Christ. It's not our profession, our faith, that guarantees that we are saved. It's our progression in the faith that gives us assurance. The person who claims to be a child of God, but whose character and conduct give no evidence of spiritual growth, is deceiving himself or, her, or herself and heading for judgment. Peter pointed out that calling and election go together. The same God who elects his, peace, his people also ordains the means to call them. The two must go together. As Paul wrote to the Thessalonian, Thessalonians, God has chosen you for salvation. He called you to, his, to this through our gospel, our gospel. Now, we don't preach election to unsaved people. We preach the gospel. But God uses the gospel to call sinners to repentance. And then those sinners discover that they were chosen by God. Peter also pointed out that election is no excuse for spiritual immaturity or for a lack of effort in a Christian life. Some believers say, what is going to be is going to be. There's nothing we can do. But Peter admonish us, admonishes us to make every effort. Well, it's true that God must work in us before uh, we can do his will. 
it's also true that we must be willing for God to work. And we must cooperate with him. Divine election must never be an excuse for human laziness. In other words, just because you know you're saved doesn't mean you don't have to do anything at all anymore. The Christian who is sure of his election and calling will never stumble, but will prove by a consistent life that he is truly a child of God. He will not always or she will not always be on the mountain type on the mountaintop but he or she will always be climbing higher. If we do these things, the things listed there in 2 Peter chapter uh, and verses 5 through 7, if we display Christian growth and character in our daily lives, then we can be sure we are converted and will one day be in heaven. In fact, the growing Christian can look forward to an abundant entrance into the eternal kingdom. The Greeks use this phrase to describe the welcome given Olympic winners when they returned home. Every believer, every true born-again believer will arrive in heaven, but some will have a more glorious welcome than others. As 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15 says, Some believers shall be saved, but only as through fire. The word ministered in 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verse 11, is the same word added in 2 Peter, or there in verse 5. And is a translation of a Greek word that means to bear the expenses of a chorus. When the Greek theological groups, when the the Greek theological groups presented their dramas, somebody had to underwrite the expensive, which were very costly, which were very great. The word came to mean to make lavish provision. If we make lavish provision to grow spiritually, then God will make lavish provision for us when we enter heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, think, just think of the blessings that a growing Christian enjoys. Fruitfulness, vision, security, all this and heaven too. The Christian life begins with faith. But that faith must lead to spiritual growth unless it's dead faith. But dead faith, dead faith is not saving faith as James chapter 2 verses 14 to verse 14 through 26 says. Faith leads to growth and growth leads to practical results in life and service. People who have this kind of Christian experience are not likely to fall prey to false teachers, to the current, you know, any current doctrine that is sweeping the nation, anything that's you know, getting people into churches but isn't really preaching the word to them, isn't really preaching the gospel, isn't getting people saved. When you really know the Lord, and the closer, the more you draw near to him, the more you fall in love with him, the more you will just experience his love as well. So now as I close, you know, I, maybe some of you again are feeling like you're not growing you're just not going anywhere in your Christian walk. Well, here, Peter just gave us ways that we can get
get that progress growing, going. How we can get out of that uh, being stuck in that muck. And it just begins one day at a time, one step at a time, one moment at a time. Those little steps of faith. Those little steps of love. Those little steps of uh, brotherly kindness, uh, goodness, knowledge, self-control. Those are proof of your prog- progress as a Christian. These spiritual supplements are from God. They can only come from the Holy Spirit living in you. And the only way to have the Holy Spirit living in you is by being born again. And so if, you've, if you're watching, listening, um, and, if you've ne- and you've never given your life to, to Christ, if I want to give you an opportunity to do that by leading you in a prayer. But you must come to the cross and confess your sins to him. You must admit that you're no one, you're nothing without him. And so if you're ready to do that, you're ready to come to the cross and be forgiven of all your sins. Close your eyes and bow your head. Pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the grave. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. I ask that you fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me, so that he will open my eyes in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, Contact us, let us know. We want to help you in your next steps of your new Christian walk. This is a great day. This is a great moment, not just here, but in eternity, because another sinner has been saved. So let us know. We want to help you. Um, call us, let us know. Send us, uh, put a comment in the YouTube comment section in the bottom um, of, the, of the video. We want to hear your story. I hope you were blessed. I hope that the Lord spoke to you through his word and through this message. So uh, thank you very much. Have a great week. Um, We love you. Goodbye and farewell. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message this morning. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. Dot com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.